two, um, which I think uh, you know, should be one of these things that Raku is really going to be very good at uh, in the future. Um, and so, oops, uh, I guess, if, you know, we'll, we'll, all right. So first a little bit about me, because I've never presented at one of these conferences before, my first tech conference. Uh, I'm not actually a programmer by trade. Uh, I'm actually a medievalist. <laughs> um, and also I really enjoy working with minority languages. I'm currently learning uh, Mirandese, which is the other language of Portugal. Um, and if uh, anybody has any questions about this or wants to you know, collaborate with me on any of these projects, uh, it's pretty easy to find me. Um, and I absolutely have to recommend the Raku channel uh, on IRC. It's one of the best places you can go to get, uh, to get help. Just as people said in some previous uh, presentations, stay online. <laughs> You might have to wait a two or three hours for somebody to see your message and, and respond. Uh, and then you've got traditional email addresses there if you, if you want to contact me. So let's get started here. If it will go now, oops. Oh, it's now going very quickly. All right, so Camilla is growing up. She's great at reading and writing. We all know that uh, Raku has really good Unicode support. Um, which is great. She's also really good with math, right? We enable rats by default, which just makes math make sense uh, for the average user. Um, she's also got great metacognition. It's me as the educator, you know, there, but, uh, you know, Jonathan and others can talk a lot more about all the really cool metaprogramming and introspection that you can do. But um, one thing is she's still been kind of stuck working generally with English, right? But now she's going abroad, right? But she's still learning and growing. We have a lot so to do. But a lot of this stuff, oops, I don't know why I just jumped there. Um, no, let's go ahead, yeah. So anyway, international stuff is big, okay? It's really big. It's also always changing. And so, that's why we have modules. Um, a lot of this stuff, the way I'm designing it for the international module sort of namespace is effectively almost to be like core technology, except that it can't be. Uh, if you look at language codes, the INA, the IANA database updates sometimes every couple of weeks. Um, and CLDR has two major updates every single year. It really just can't go into core, but it works great in module space. And we can actually, with the way that Raku works, we can basically almost make it work as if it were in core, all right? Um, but there's still a lot to do. We're not done at all with this work. Um, the way I kind of think of it is, you know, if somebody's going from uh, being a kid up to becoming a diplomat, we kind of have a couple of steps to go. And Camilla is about, here, getting ready to start her study abroad. All right, um, not sure if I'd say quite that all of these modules are production ready, which may be our next step working abroad, but we're getting there. So let's think about, oh, also, so if you use any of these, please test it out, report your issues, and if you can ultimately contribute. Um, like I said, it's international stuff, it's big. There's lots and lots and lots of little things that can be done. So if anybody wants to jump in, uh, it's actually not that bad because um, everything is so compartmentalized, each like little function. Um, it's, it's very easy to sort of just uh, jump in on, on say, okay, let me, I kind of want to really do this for my program, but uh, the modules don't handle it yet. So you can kind of code something up real quick and you know, add it into the, into the rest of the, the modules. So a couple of common tasks that we have in internationalization, and these are the ones that I'm going to talk about. Obviously, there's a lot more, um, but we've got to deal with languages, the tags, selecting languages, testing things, formatting, especially dates and times, and numbers, parsing. This is one that I think is really where Raku's uh, strengths are going to show, um, and also localization. 
uh, which is, you know, we're presenting our different strings for users based on their languages. So the first module I'm gonna talk about is international CLDR. Uh, and CLDR, for those of you who haven't worked with it, it means, uh, if it will click here, crazy large data, no, actually it, it doesn't. It means common locale data repository, but it's huge. Um, I think the, just the straight download of the XML files is something like you know, 30 megabytes or 40 megabytes or something like that. I mean, it's a huge amount of, you know, just straight text data uh, to work with. Um, but it's pretty easy to access in, in Raku. Um, all you have to do is uh, I create a, have a giant hash tree that you can get it from. And that's all you have to do. Just say use international CLDR, grab the data for the language, and you can just access this hash elements. Uh, it's a very deep tree, as you can see, um, but it gets you all of this data. Uh, one thing I've been doing uh, more recently is adding attribute access. Um, the main advantage of this is it will be much faster. Um, I think uh, Jonathan's talked at some point, or at least on IRC, about the fact that attribute access in Raku will always be uh, much, much faster than using hashes. Um, so I'm slowly going through the database uh, and kind of converting each thing into these nice objects um, that will also handle fallbacks the way that they're supposed to. And, and so that you can go ahead and just grab for any language and it might ultimately fall back to root, um, but it'll be very transparent to you, know, you the, the user. That said, um, don't access this stuff directly unless you're making a module. All right, um, it's because it's it's just not easy to use. It's really just a, a database of information, um, and it's much easier to make a module <clears throat> or to use a module that's using this data, uh, as I think you'll see here coming up. So, um, next thing we've got here, or let's talk about languages. We're gonna start with language tags. Now. Uh, you might have used these before. I'm sure everybody has seen some of them, right? And they're really simple, right? I mean, for example, we could do something like CA for Catalonian, and we could add on an ES and just specify, no, no, we mean Catalonian is spoken in Spain, not Andorra. We could even specify Latin script, even though that's the implied one for it. We could even give the Valencian variant, as we would just call Valencian, um, not too bad. But wait, what's that? There are further extensions to the language tags uh, and they all have information that can be sometimes really good and useful and interesting. For instance, the transformed content one, we could, for instance, say, add on H-E Arab E-S, meaning that this is not just Catalonian written, or the Valencian from Spain written in Latin script, but it was translated from Hebrew written in the Arabic script in Spain. And yes, that exists. Um, typed on a keyboard, not just any keyboard, an Android keyboard, an Android Spanish keyboard, an Android Spanish keyboard, from 2015, done with Google Translate. And it just goes on and on and on. So it's, uh, it's a lot of stuff. And so dealing with language tags, you don't wanna just grab in a string because you, it's much more difficult to work with it. So, what do we have here in Raku for language tags? If it will go to the next slide. There we go. So all we have to do is um, just make a new one, but then we can find out information about it, which again, will make your life easier when you're working with these tags. So you don't have to try to split it back apart and figure out, well, okay, is CMN, is that a language? Is that a, a you know, script tag? It's already all taken care of for you. 
You can also make them fairly easily. Um, and you'll end up with these strings that then you can pass in into any other application that's asking for uh, a language tag. And so this is its default stringification is the canonical forms. Um, I've also enabled a whole bunch of enums that will make your life easier. So if you wanted to talk about Maori, uh, if you can't remember what the code is for Maori, you don't have to. You can just say, hey, give me a new language tag using these languages. Um, and eventually I'd like to make it so you can just say like language tag new and just put in the enums. I'm not quite sure if I can do as much introspection. I'm sure, actually, I'm sure I can do that much introspection, but um, for right now you still have to use the, the named parameters. Um, but these enums aren't great just for creating them. They can also make your code a lot cleaner, um, like in conditionals. So I could say something like this. Say, you know, greetings from reverse gravity land if the region equals New Zealand or Australia. And that's going to be a lot of times, especially for if you've got some more odd languages or regions um, that won't jump out at people immediately, uh, this can make your code a lot cleaner and a lot, much, much, much easier to read. All right. Um, another thing we want to do is choosing the language for a user, right? So um, as people now are using um, uh, you know, Core Red, some of these other um, programs, as you're making um, web applications, uh, a lot of times you, you've got to choose a language for the user. And the user will give you some languages and then you've got to kind of make a best fit. So this is already built in um, to the language tag. And so all you have to do is determine whatever program or whatever languages your program has, and then grab your user languages. And I'm going to talk about that function in a little bit here. Uh, and then you just say, hey, look up language tag. Uh, I don't necessarily like the, the naming of the subroutine as much, but that's the, the, the standard that I'm following. Uh, that's the term they use for it is look up. Um, so I just, I try to, as much as I can, when I'm doing some of these things, I try to match up with the terminology used by, um, by the different standards. Uh, in this case, it's the, the BCP 47, um, standard has determined how to do that. Um, you can also do in the plural, this one will actually give you a ranked ordering. So if for whatever reason you've got maybe all of your resources aren't um, available for every language and sometimes you want to be able to fall back to maybe a second uh, locale, then you can use the, the plural version of it. And in fact, really, when you use the singular one, it's just syntactical sugar. So uh, another big important module here uh, is user language. It's Dirt simple to use. You just say use international user language and you can grab the top language, preferred language for a user, or you can grab a whole list of them if that's available for uh, their system. The only catch here is that we have to uh, add this support per, on, on a per operating system basis. So please check and see if it works on your system. I've tested it on a couple builds of Linux. Uh, I've got my Mac at home and I've tested it with my Windows machine at work. Um, but if for whatever reason it doesn't and it just falls back to English, which is sort of the default default language, uh, file an issue on GitHub and let's get it figured out. Uh, I really want to make this be the one stop shop for determining a user language uh, or the preferred language that user wants to have. But there's one other little thing that user language uh, will do for us, <clears throat> uh, which is it, it will move to the next slide for me. Yeah. Why is it stuck? Oh, yeah. All right. Is it going? OK. You can also, when you import this module, you can uh, include the name parameter override. And this will add one more function into your code. And you can say override user languages. And what this will do is anytime now you make a call to user language or user languages, it will use this instead, regardless of what your system has. And so if you're wanting to test, if a user says, hey, I'm doing some weird stuff or whatever, and I'm, you know, I've got, my system is in Kenyan Swahili, great. You can use this and try to check and see what's going on with it. Um, and then you can clear the override if you need to. 
one kind of thing to point out about this is these overrides do have a global effect. Um, and I've been trying to figure out a way to lexically scope these, but I've not quite been entirely successful with that yet. So not a huge deal, but just kind of be aware of it. All right, <clears throat> another thing we have is formatting stuff. So the first uh, formatter I'm going to talk about is lists. And all this stuff is grabbing data out of CLDR, but it means you don't have to deal with all the, the crazy stuff. But I'm kind of curious as how many people have maybe done something like this before. You get a list, you want to present it to the user, and you want to say, you know, apple, comma, banana, comma, and orange. Right, and so you've probably done something, you said join them up with commas for all of them except for the last one. Then you add in another comma and then an and, unless you're an evil person and you don't use the Oxford comma. Uh, and then you add in the last item. But just no, that's ugly. Don't, don't do that, right? Don't make your life harder than it needs to be, right? By using this formatter, all we have to say is format list. And these are the defaults that are in other uh, applications that use this, uh, namely ICU, uh, is to default to and. But there are other versions of it. We can use or, or we can use a unit, which doesn't is kind of neutral to it. And this is one of these things where I say that even if you're not necessarily making your program uh, be used for other languages, this is something that can help you out in a purely 100% English environment. Right? You don't have to reinvent the wheel, but you can use these technologies that are designed for internationalization and just use them in, um, in a monolingual program. And so this is the what you would get if we did this in English, right? but we could also change this to Spanish. And you can see how it changes the, uh, the formatting. Uh, one thing to point out is that uh, it's not entirely uh, aware of everything that's going on. <clears throat> when the people who write the database do this, they do it for the most generic things. So those of you who know Spanish, uh, sometimes the Y and the O there can change to other letters. It won't do that for you. It's not quite that smart. We also do it for Arabic. I'm assuming this is all right. I don't speak Arabic. Um, we do it for Cherokee. And there's a couple other types basically to just make it shorter or narrower most of the time for um, in the case of like English or Spanish, a lot of the, the European languages won't do much of a difference. But in a lot of the Eastern languages, the Asian languages, the narrow and shorter forms can actually save you a little bit more space uh, if you're really uh, pressed for, for space. Next, we've got the number formatter. Um, and this again is one of those things where if you're writing a monolingual program, that's fine. This will still help you out. And you can still do some really nice things with it. Um, but then you're also set up if you need to go to another language. So we just start off saying use international format numbers. And let's just give ourselves a totally random number. And we just say format number. That's it. And our defaults kick in. Oh, wait, this is all right. This is assuming my system is on. Uh, yeah, I got these back backwards on my examples. Sorry, that's the example for Spanish. Um, and then that's actually the example for English. That's my mistake. Um, but you can specify the language and override it if you want. Okay. Um, you can also switch to sometimes languages have totally different scripts. So if we go to Burmese, you see we still get the number formatted, but in a completely different uh, decimal system. Um, but the, our options aren't limited to just the language, right? We can also use scientific numbers. And so this is actually the exponential notation for Arabic. Um, there's a couple other types we have. We can also do percentages and engineering notation. Engineering notation is the same as scientific, but uh, instead of doing one digit and then the decimal um, and then setting the power based on that, it um, make sure things are grouped on the exponent is always in a power of three or a, a multiple of three <clears throat> and a couple of options and some defaults that we have here is the language will default to user language which is why i say that user language uh module is so important so please test it out in your system uh system is the decimal system that it will use 
uh, or the, the numbering system that it will use. Uh, right now, I've just got support for the decimal ones, but there are some others uh, that exist um, that are algorithmically based, um, and those will hopefully be coming soon. Uh, you can also do count. This one you're probably rarely going to use, which is why I put it in, in gray here. Um, that one, certainly when we st uh, when you start doing like ordinals and some other stuff, some of these numbers will change a little bit um, based on some other things that can be around them. Um, and then pattern uh, is the actual like formatting pattern. I rarely would kind of play around with this because it's a kind of a weird format to use, but if you want to go and learn it, uh, the notation that's used for it, uh, it's worse than like, you know, string formatting. Um, but anyway, so um, those are our numbers that we can format. If the click will move me forward here. Um, we've got dates. Now these currently only support the Gregorian calendar. Um, that is something I'm uh, hoping to uh, fix down the road, <clears throat> but calendar math is not easy. Um, not only not easy, it's not always precise. You can't always be 100% sure of conversions. Um, but anyway, so let's grab a date and kind of see what we can do with this. So we'll just say, grab my formatter and just say format time. 5.06 p.m. And in CLDR, the way it's specified, the default for English is to use 12 hour time. But if we want it to be shorter, we're again, we're pressed for space or something, we can use this one, just give it a length of short. And now it says 5.06 p.m. We also do dates. So I'll grab that same uh, date time. But now I'll just do format date and it'll pop out November 24th, 1984. Or I can do date and time together and I get the two of them combined. <clears throat> and so again, you're writing a monolingual program. You know, this is a much cleaner output for date time than you get if you've if you've just made date time new in uh, you know in a normal script in in core Raku. It gives you sort of a UTC, you know, kind of a standardized ISO representation of it that's not very clean, not very readable. This is. So using this, uh, using these international modules will just help monolingual code and get you prepped in case you want to go international later. There's also some variants on it. We can go longer <clears throat> and we can go really long. Um, now, some formatting fields aren't quite yet supported, like time zones. So these, the full one, for instance, would have included the time zone on it. Um, if you hit those, you might get a little warning that says it's been unimplemented yet. Uh, time zones are kind of been an interesting issue for uh, dealing with because Raku uh, in the date time <clears throat> only includes the time zone offset. It doesn't actually include the specific time zone. Um, and kind of had a little debate on on the, the Raku problem solving as to whether that should be done or not. Um, ultimately decided not to because like I mentioned before, um, this international stuff, it's constantly changing. And so time zone offset won't ever change, but a specific time zone can. Um, and it's not necessarily stable. So it's not in core. I'm kind of trying to think of some solutions for how we can deal with that in the international one. If you have any ideas, please, you know, let's talk. Um, so let's continue on. We can look at these if my, don't know why the clicking is not going here. Oh, so we can also look at this, uh, change the language and you can kind of see some of the differences. So if I have Asturian, for instance, um, you'll see that how it's, uh, all of its defaults are, uh, we can go from Asturian, we can go into Bengali. And again, you can see it'll change up the format. Uh, for a lot of different languages, the kind of the standard length and the long length are the same. Um, you can see that here with Mandarin, for instance, they're, they're the same. Um, you know, or we can go to Dutch. Um, you know, um, so we've got all those different versions that we can do. And all you have to do is just change the language or the user has their default language and we make it nice for them, all right? Um, so that's the formatters that I have right now. Hopefully I'll be getting more of them. 
But now I want to talk about probably one of my favorite bits, which is the tokens. Uh, and these are common regex tasks made easy. And this is where I think really Raku shines. So right now, what we have available <clears throat> are uh, digits. We got alphas, punctuation, and numbers, which is my absolute favorite, All right? And what these do is they function as sort of a, like their name suggests, a localized version of these character classes, right? We've all used digit alpha, upper, lower, punct at some point when we've written regexes. Um, but they have a scope that's sometimes larger than we want, right? So if we look at digit, it's really just zero to nine, at least on my system, because my systems that use you know, Latin script for everything. But if you use digit, digit doesn't just capture zero to nine, it captures zero to nine, it captures, you know, uh, all the other different decimal systems that are in existence. And there's probably, I think right now in CLDR, there's about 30 of them that are defined. So your options aren't just 10 digits that you're going to capture, you're going to capture potentially 300 different characters. And that's sometimes probably not what you want. So if you're in English, you get zero to nine, right? If you're in Arabic, it'll default to just their versions of the digits. If you're in Luri, you'll get a slightly different version of the Arabic script digits and so forth and so on. There are a couple options for it. Uh, and again, this is kind of a cool thing. I think uh, a lot a lot of people don't play around with doing uh, passing arguments into tokens, and I think it's uh, something that definitely should be done more often. Uh, so you can specify a language if you want. Again, it will just default to user language. Um, and then there's a type, uh, which defaults to uh, default. Um, but you can see the difference. If my user language is English, local digit will equate to those. But if I specify uh, Telugu, Default, it actually does zero to nine. But I can add in type native. And now I have the native system for the language. Um, there are a couple of other types that are defined traditional, financial, and broad. Um, traditional sometimes might have an algorithmic system. So down the road, when I get, uh, say, like Roman numerals put in and you do Latin. You could say Latin and give me the traditional numbers and hopefully if everything works fine to be able to detect the Roman numerals. Um, although since I is one, you might grab a little more than you want. Um, and then broad is one that I've done uh, added in myself, which will grab all of them. And it'll grab both financial digits in some of the Asian languages. Uh, you have slightly different forms for financial transactions. Um, it'll grab the default, which in most cases is either Latin or Arabic. Um, and uh, also the native system. Next we have alpha. And, and this is when you only wanna grab the core alphabetical characters for language. Again, if you've used just the token alpha, you know it's a little bit broader probably than you want it to be because it will grab uh, not just A to Z, it'll grab A to Z and every single Korean character, every single Japanese character, every single Arabic character, every single every other character, as long as it's an alphabetically defined character in Unicode. Again, probably more than you want in a lot of cases. So just like the others, we have the option to do um, languages. So let's take a look at some of them. If I set it to Asturian, uh, it's effectively equivalent to a case insensitive A to Z, adding in my accented characters, and that's that. There's also an option to do um, a broad version of it. And this implements in what in CLDR is the auxiliary characters. So these aren't necessarily characters that you'll see every day, but occasionally in texts might come up enough that we might want to still capture them along the way. In English, for instance, right, if you have resume, you might want to still capture it if it's got the, the accented E, or in naive if it's got the, the two dots on the, the I. And so the broad one will capture that as well. <clears throat> Sometimes the space is quite large. Uh, if we go to Korean, uh, I think there's about 16, in that little dot dot there, I think there's about 16,000 characters. 
Uh, so, and, and the little ellipses there, that goes on for about another 2000 characters after that that are individually specified. So sometimes this can be still very large uh, in some of the Asian languages. Um, but again, it works, for, here it is for Bulgarian, All right? Now, for languages with a distinction between upper and lowercase, you can also use just local upper or local lower, just like you would use upper and lower to limit your search field to just one half or the other. Obviously, in a language like, say, Mandarin, it's not going to make a difference. They're going to be, you know, essentially one and the same. All right, so let's see where we're at now. Um, my favorite of the tokens. Um, and this is kind of comes off of some work that I've done previously. If any of y'all were watching the uh, or reading through the, the Advent Day posts or the Advent calendar for Araku, uh, my day was I did the fuzzy token uh, with my very fun uh, Santa had too much eggnog title. Um, and what this allows, one of the things that Araku allows us to do is we can create these reusable tokens, which all of these previous ones are, are that, but you can sometimes do a little bit more with them. And sometimes you can modify the, the actual match data by doing a mix in of a role. And so in the fuzzy token, I actually tried to correct the string so that when you would print out the match, it would actually print out something that it didn't match to, but what we assumed it actually matched to because we try to correct spelling. Uh, and this one kind of builds off of that work. So uh, again, I don't know why this is, uh, since I'm not capturing my clicks here. All right, so this is the, by far to me, the most powerful of the tokens. Again, I don't know why I just jumped here, but it'll detect not just digits, but entire formatted numbers. So uh, let's grab my text and let's set it to this whole thing here, which is from the Wikipedia article for Houston, where we all should have been ideally, were we in better circumstances. And um, I'm just gonna say, let's try to add up all these numbers together. Right. Um, if you can imagine being asked to do that task, um, if you look at this document, there's a lot of different types of numbers. There's numbers without commas, there's numbers with commas, there's numbers with decimals, there's percents. But I want you to add them all up. So what we can do, again, I don't know why this keynote export is not showing my code bit by bit like it's supposed to. All right. So we can do, all right, now it looks like it's going correctly. All right, um, so we can say, just let's grab the text and let's do a global match of local number. And again, this is just defaulting to English, the text is in English. And let's loop over the text. Please don't use this loop signature. That's kind of an ugly one, but it works for this purpose. All right, and so all we're gonna do is do total, add to itself local number each time and be done with it and say it. And we get this number. So there's a couple things going on in the background here. When you do that match, we actually, I mix in a role, a numeric role. And so not only do I capture the number, I also parse the number for you so that it takes out the commas and you know turns it into an integer or if you have decimal beyond it, it adds that in. If it's a percentage, it goes ahead and divides it by 100 for you. Uh, this is really awesome because if you're working, say, with something in French, where your thousand separator is a period and your decimal separator is a comma, you as a programmer don't need to know that. You just use local token and you put plus on it or local number and you do a plus and you're good to go. That's all you have to do. So. How do we know that this is right? Well, let's um, move to the next slide if it will do that for me. If it will do that for me. Okay, so um, now that it just, I'm just gonna add in this little print total and say total along the way. Uh, and we can see here on the, the bottom right where it will spit out all the numbers as we go along the way. And so we can compare that over here to what we had. And so as you can see, we start off with 2019 and then we add in this, the 2 million something. We add that into the 6 million something, uh, 2018. 
And then we get to our first decimal number and you can see the decimal shows up. It caught the two there because of the kilometer. We don't have units yet. I'm working on it. That's in, that's another thing we'll be able to do eventually. And you can notice the 90%, it correctly adds it in as 0.9 rather than the number 90. So it's capturing all this stuff the way that it should be. But if you want to return it back as a string, what it's printing there is the string version in the middle. So there's a lot of really awesome things that we can do here with the tokens. And I uh, definitely hope we can get a lot more of them in there. You imagine just being able to put in local date and have it grab all your dates for you. And just throw that into any regex, into any grammar. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of really nice things that we'll be able to do down the road. The last thing I'm going to talk about, um, and then hopefully we'll have some time for questions if anyone has them, um, is the text localization. Um, so the first one that I've worked with here uh, is, and I don't know why this is not uh, going as fast as it should here. Come on, click. All right. Uh, is with Fluent. Now, Fluent is a text localization engine it was created by Mozilla. Um, it is probably right now the, the one of the best ones that exists, but also the fact that it's supported by Mozilla. They're uh, converting all of Firefox over to using this engine. I figured it's a really good one to start with. Um, so I'm going to show a couple of examples of how this works um, and how easy I've tried to make uh, localizing because if you've seen a lot of other ones, you've got so much boilerplate code, and I hate boilerplate code with a with a passion. Um, so all we have to do, add a localization base path where you're going to store all your files, and then add in a list of your languages that you have, um, and then we can just say something like that: say localized hello world. And again, use your languages working there in the background. And it's detected that my system's on English, so you get hello world. Or we could do <clears throat> hello world in Mirandiz, and we get viva mundo. Again, if your user language is set and that's all you need, you're just writing a script that somebody's gonna use in the command line, don't even have to specify your language, just let it all work. Um, it's that simple, right? Now, the format for Fluent, um, don't want to get into too much detail on that just because it's kind of its own little thing, but um, the files are designed to be pretty readily uh, legible. So for instance, I could say a new mail message, <clears throat> but I can also add in the counts. So we'll be passing in a variable here um, and we can give specific messages based on the content of them. Um, this one and other are actually counts um, that come from CLDR. Um, most uh, <clears throat> most European languages will probably only have one and other, um, but like Arabic will have one, two, and other because it has a dual case uh, with its numbers. Russian is if any of you, you know if any of you see, speak any of the Slavic, you know that there's just kind of their number string format is just, it's just a nightmare. The endings you have to do based on whether it the number ends in this number or it's between zero and hundred or valid, whatever. It's crazy. But uh, this will help your localizers to be able to handle all those formatting a little bit cleaner. So um, I could just say, say localized, new mail, one count. You've got one new message. I do it with eight. You've got eight new messages. And if I do 42, ah, your new messages contain some very interesting information there. All right, but it gets a lot more powerful than that. Um, and this is kind of, some of this is dealing now with the additions that I've done uh, within the localization environment. But let's say I grab this one out of the Spanish file. And so I just wanna say, hey, it's a nice car, it's a nice computer, right? Well, there's some catches there. Uh, in Spanish, uh, there's a couple different words for car, there's a couple different words for computer. Um, and in the case of computer, one of them's uh, masculine, or two of them are masculine, one of them's feminine. But our localizer is smart enough, they know that they need to deal with a, a gender version here. Um, but they can also default and say, this is my default value. I want by default car to be carro and computer to be computadora. And I'm also gonna tell you computadora is a feminine word in case you need to use that somewhere else, 
And this allows for a lot of reuse of terminology uh, as you go through. And then we can specify, hey, in Spain, they don't call car a carro, it's a coche, and it's an ordenador, and it's masculine, not feminine. And in Chile, they use computador, and it's masculine. And in Argentina, they use alto. And so we can take these files, and by default, if my system is, say, I don't know, like Mexican Spanish, uh, it'll just say, es un buen carro, right? And it'll just grab from the main ES file. But if I say Spain Spanish, right, it'll still grab the main message out of the, the Spanish one, but it will override it with the one term for car. Same if I go to Argentinian, it'll override it with alto. But if I do Mexican, uh, specify Mexican Spanish, it'll just default back to the original, the main Spanish localization. Uh, so this can also be one of these things where if, if localizers know that certain terms are going to be different, you can actually manage to populate them all the way across the file uh, with, with pretty good ease. Um, and so we can also even say the computer, and you can see here, by default, it's una buena computadora, but it's un buen ordenador, and everything kind of gets taken care of for you. Um, one of the ideas of Fluent, um, or one of their kind of going thoughts, is that we should remove a lot of the work from the programmer and instead put it on the localizer, because the localizers know their language is best and they know what to deal with. Um, so on the one hand, if you want to do some of these very sort of complex uh, sort of formattings, you can always do them, but it's on your localizer to do it. Uh, you might have to feed them in information, but you can always feed in extra information that doesn't get used. Um, so one of the reasons I did Fluent is because just like Perl and Raku, simple things are easy, right? You don't have to use all those extra features. If you want to use an old style, let me name, you know, let me have my uh, localized string name include all those different types of information. You can still do that, but complex things are possible. Um, so if you want more information on that format, um, you can visit projectfluent.org. Um, but the Raku version of Fluent includes an entire localization manager. Uh, so if you check out the, the GitHub page for that, you can see where I talk about it. Um, in the future, I'm going to try to pull apart the manager and uh, Fluent itself uh, with the goal that we can just add in other localization um, uh, formats and still have the same interface so that we could ultimately have one manager that will handle not just fluent files, but make text files, xlib files, and do them all together all at once. And you can just pull in the messages as, as you want. So all that said, what's next? Like I said, uh, in terms of international and Raku, we still have a lot of stuff to do. I think I've made a fair bit of progress here. Um, out of CLDR, there's a couple things I want to do. Um, for, first thing is completely separate out the modules. Uh, this was my mistake early on. I started putting everything. I had the one module international CLDR, and I started adding in all the formats and tokens inside of that module. Uh, I'm going to pull them apart and leave CLDR to just do be a database and nothing more. Um, that won't take too long. Definitely want to add in more tokens, more formatters. Uh, specifically currency, which would be really good if you're doing, you know, any sort of, um, you know, apps that need to use money in them. Also RBNF, which is the rule-based number formatting. Um, this will allow you to then output instead of just like the digits and say, you know, uh, format number, um, and it just adds in the commas or whatever, it can actually spell it out in word form. Um, and so that should be possible fairly soon, um, which again would be really nice because It'll be just a one-stop shop. You can handle it if you want to grab it for English, or then you can, of course, apply it to other languages. Um, lots of optimizations. Um, key example of this is that alpha token. Um, right now, all it does is the actual token itself has an array in it, and just says match this array. And the array might have 16,000 items in it. Um, that is not very fast. There are definitely faster ways to do that. Um, and I'll work on that down the road uh, to make it much faster. Um, but at the moment, it just works, but maybe not as fast as I'd like it to be. Because uh, in like the case of Chinese, it'll be literally for every character testing 
32,000 versions. Um, sorting. Uh, this is another a, a big kind of uh, issue when you're you know, presenting things to people. And I just want to give an absolute shout out to Samantha McVeigh. She did a lot of the work for allowing us to do Unicode sorting to begin with in Raku. Um, and I'm hoping uh, soon, to, she had, a, I think it was one of the Pearl Foundation grants, uh, or maybe it was the Google Summer Code, I can't remember which one, um, to put in the, the sorting. And I'm hoping that, um, you know, I'll be able to work with her and, you know, figure out how can we get this done in a localized manner. Um, it's in more VM, I think, if I remember correctly. So you might have to do some things there to enable it, but <clears throat> hopefully that'll be coming soon. Also, non Gregorian calendars. Uh, again, calendars are tough, um, but uh, Jean Forget, I think I might be pronouncing that wrong. Uh, he's done a lot of work on that already, so I'm hoping that maybe I'll be able to pull in uh, or either collaborate with him or pull in some of his work. He's got separate modules for it. Um, also, another fun one is emoji names and descriptors. Um, these are also included in CLDR. <laughs> So if, you, if you've ever wondered, uh, this happens to me occasionally when I'm on, on my cell phone and I start typing in, trying to find an emoji and I don't pull it up. And I'm like, wait, why? I, I know this emoji exists. Why can't I find it with this name? Well, it's because my keyboard had switched from English to Spanish. And these keyboards are actually pulling those emoji descriptors off of CLDR. Um, and so you can actually um, pull in this information out of there. I'm, again, I'll try to get a nice interface for it. But there are other you know, useful things for this. If you're having to do some text accessibility and you want to actually read out text for somebody, here's where you can actually get the you know, descriptors for them. And in general, just some other ICU style features. ICU is the main um, localization or international tool set uh, that's written in uh, C and C++ and in Java. Um, but it uses, again, boilerplate code. I don't like it. That's why I'm writing everything from scratch for Raku. Uh, there's also some stuff outside of CLDR that we'll be doing. Again, more localization formats. Um, these are the three that I'm going to prioritize. Uh, make text, just because that's what we inherit you know, in the, in the Perl and Raku world. Uh, Xlif and message format, just again, because those are sort of industry standards. Language identification. Um, a lot of you have probably used Perl's Lingua Identify, um, and that actually shouldn't be too terribly difficult to pull in. Um, just a question of you know, how do we want it to you know, interface with it. Um, and then also spell checking. Uh, and I've actually already done some work on this with some other projects. Um, the main ones I'm going to focus on is on Hunspell and Newspell. Um, they are sort of the default engine in a lot of different programs. Uh, if you use uh, LibreOffice, uh, Hunspell is in there at its core. Uh, even on Mac OS, you can just like drag two files over and, it, and it's using Hunspell in the background. Um, so that'll let us be able to maximize the number of spell checkers that are language that we can spell check in uh, once I get those in there. So that's the future. If you would like to help out with it, please get in touch with me um, because, you know, as you see, I've made a little bit of progress, but there's still a lot, a lot of stuff to do. Um, so lastly, lastly, if it will move forward to the next slide where I don't know why it's not, but, oh, there we go. Thank you to the organizers and all those who made the Pearl Raku conference in the cloud a success. And so I guess now I've got a question. If we have any time, I might've actually just used up all my time. Sorry. <laughs> uh, we, we can go for like four or five more minutes. Okay. Folks, you can just unmute and ask if you have a question. Uh, hi, um, I guess I, I have a small question. Is at some point I implemented uh, uh, RBNF for uh, Perl six, and I say Perl six and not Raku because it's fairly old at this point. Uh, are you aware of Lingua Number? Um, I did not see it in that one. I actually last night when I was finishing up these slides, I did a quick search for, and I, but I searched under Raku and I searched Raku RBNF because I wanted to make sure to signal previous work. So I will, I will go and look that it, up. It's not working. So uh, <laughs> I would, I would love to, to have some help and maybe uh, 
figure out if you have some better ideas too so yeah absolutely um in in all like sort of the core code there are uh raku grammars everywhere um and so i've really gotten some good experience kind of working with that um and if yeah i'd love to collaborate and and you know get that in there yeah. uh because it really enables a lot of other stuff once we've got those yes yeah, so you won't review my mistakes exactly <laughs> <laughs> looking at the chat <laughs> oh i forgot to pull up the chat on here i'm sorry if people had uh uh stuff in here um, I don't think there were really any questions no. in the chat. Yeah. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> Somebody had mentioned uh, and the Roman numerals, and I said that actually will be directly with the RBNFs in there. Hey. I, I would like to thank you for running with this because it, it, it just validates the, the work of so many people uh, in. Uh, seeing forward to the, the internationalization of, of, uh, of uh, what we're doing. Well, I, I have to say, like, one of the things that, um, you know, has always attracted me to both Pearl and to Raku, uh, and I think it has a lot to do with your training as a linguist, is that it just, for me, as somebody who also works with languages, uh, I'm a Spanish professor by, by trade, it just makes more sense than a lot of other languages, right? And and um, you know, I don't, I don't know. It just, it's, it's clear to me that it was designed by linguists. <laughs> yes, here's a, here's your fellow medievalist sitting in the corner here. <laughs> um, I'm just gonna glance over these questions again one more time here. Uh, let's see. Um, well, I hate to put you on the spot, but could you show us your localization manager? Um, if you could just bring it up and run it for a moment, that would be cool. Uh, I, don't not, I, to, understand. I don't have it to run it, but um, let me go to uh, GitHub Fluent. Um, I think I've got it under a rock. Um, okay, let me see if I can pull it up here. Where I have um, so really the main thing I've got here is um, uh, if you can see it here is uh, yeah. <laughs> Within a module, if you want, what you do is just under the resources, I just put in there like localization and you put in your the different files that you want. Um, you can put in the, like I said, the different uh, base paths. Um, resources are handled a little bit differently. So if it's in a, a resource path, uh, you just have to tag it and say, hey, this is in um, you know the resources uh, file or in the part of the module. Um, but what I did kind of to kind of help out, like let's say you have a, you're running a website on it, but you're, this is on the server, but you have multiple websites. There's also an extra option you can do when you add in the base path, which is a domain. Um, and then you can specify that domain when you're pulling in the, when you're grabbing the localized files um, so that you can keep them basically totally uh, separate from each other. And then it won't try to you know, fall back on the other one. Um, and so um, that's really kind of all that I've got, you know, in that sense of the manager. Um, but like in Fluent originally, um, if, if it won't allow you to fall back mid string. So you have to have the entirety of a message within one localization file. And I kind of made some modifications so that you can have that, just change that one term in one file and it'll fall back, you know, across the, the um, you know, the local the string building uh, part. Um, but, um, you know, there's, uh, you can also do things like you say lazy or you can force it to load everything all at once. So if you're doing it on server, you might want to just have it load all your strings, everything all at once, or you might want to just load it as you go. Um, the most of the international modules do that. Uh, the CLDR is lazy loading. So if the first time you use a language, you might have like a half a second delay as it pulls in all the data. Um, even on even on like the Mac, if I try to change the system language, there's like a little half second delay where it's pulling in you know all the data just because it's so much uh, data for each language. But um, you know, definitely play around with it. But uh, I'm like I said, I'm gonna try to pull that apart from it so that we can then use the same interface, but for other formats. Okay, thanks a lot. Right.